Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hi, everybody. Squib Bikes, Ivy Audrain. Hi. And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. This is going to be a fun crew. I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> today, we are going to answer quite a few questions that you've submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. So if you're listening to this, you can submit questions there. You can rate this podcast and share it with your friends. And if you're watching on YouTube right now, give it a thumbs up. And we're happy to have you in the live chat. We're going to talk about training in the heat. There were so many questions that came in this week. And I mean, it makes sense. Heat wave in Europe, heat wave in the UK, heat wave in the US. It's, it makes sense uh, around the world. There's a lot of it going on. Australia, probably not so much, but uh, we're also going to talk about fat burning and, indul- and ultra endurance athletes and kind of a question that came up as a result of a discussion that we had recently. But before we do all that, everybody should head to our YouTube channel because we recently released a video on sprint intensity training in our sci- cycling science explained series. It's awesome. Uh, lots of fun. Go check it out. I think that within that one, we have a reference to Goonies. So if you like Goonies, you should tune in and check it out. It's a good scene. Um, but first, can Ivy and I brag for a bit? Is that okay, gents? Is that cool? Brag about what? What happened? Tahoe Trail 100. Oh. Ivy and I stood on top of the podium. Um, how many people were in your category? You know, that's probably a detail we don't have to talk about. <laughs> were you, were you uh, <laughs> second to last? <laughs> I only saw two people in that podium picture. Or two, two teams. <laughs> but I mean, no, honestly, was... though, I looked at the times. You guys went fast. super fast. Like, oh, because the times are consistent year to year. And you can yeah. compare to other people. You were... What were you sub five? Oh uh, yeah, sub five. Yeah, that is yeah. like Red Corral at uh, at yeah. Leadville, right? Let's. It is. That's is that close to purple, right? Or what's the yeah, one well, after gold? No, it's close red. Red is the one. The next one from there is silver, and then I think gold yeah. or red and then so, gold, something like that. Yeah. I think y'all were close to silver, weren't you? Yeah. Yep. So we weren't far off, like the time that when I did it prior to Leadville. Uh, when I was trying to improve my corral position, we were close. We were like 10 minutes off, which is super wow. impressive. Uh, was it, Ivy, what did you go out Ivy too hard? crushed it. Yeah. But intentionally, yeah. since I only did one lot, yeah. one lap, like the, I got to race it like an XCO race. Cause you know, there's a difference, right? Like when you're pacing, uh, when you're doing a marathon mountain bike race, when you get to a climb, you don't lean into the climb with your effort. And instead what you do is you fall back to your pacing plan. If that makes sense. Right. Whereas with cross country Olympic, when you get to the climbs, you kind of have to lean into those climbs a bit. Like you, you just like, all right, gas on, here we go. And that was a really different experience to ride this course for me. Instead of just adhering to that tight pacing plan, it was, well, let's go hard. Now it wasn't like, let me sprint and completely empty the tank and blow up instantly. I wasn't, you know, pacing poorly to that degree, but instead it was the groups going, I got to stay with the group and I got to try to hold with them. And then once it shattered, then it was like, okay, now that I'm off the back of that front group, now I just have to pick up all the people in front of me that are shattering and pick them off. So it meant that I raced it way more aggressively in terms of the effort that I put out. It was hard. And too, uh, for this has a little bit of drafting, but mainly there's a single track section. So if it was all fire roads, probably, and there wasn't any draft, that strategy would have probably been slower, but because there is single track and John can get stuck, there's a small single track town, but behind people, it's mm-hmm. smart to get in front of people. And that's what you do in XCO races, right? That's why you you sprint at the beginning of it to get in that good position. And although this yeah. one is a long time for that, it's still, I've been stuck behind people and you just wait and wait and wait and wait. So did you get stuck or were you happy on that single track section that's pretty long? I was never stuck behind a single person. Uh, the whole race. So we basically like we started the race and you start on a paved road going downhill and then it starts to climb and they told us to obey the center line rule. So to not cross that double yellow line because the road was not closed. I was on the front line and I was with a bunch of, uh, it was like all the pro athletes. And I just rolled up to the front because I figured that I wasn't going to be far off their pace. So it was cause it was self seating basically like seed where you wanted to figured I wouldn't humble, be far off guy. their pace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, well, he was right. A strategic one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he is right. He is right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I put myself there and we started rolling and everyone was just coasting down the road. There's a big no, no that happened after this. Then all the, the amateurs and, and, and the folks behind, they, they were like, well, why is everybody just coasting when we're rolling downhill on this road? And they ignored the center line rule. And suddenly mm. we got swarmed by like 40 mm. average people. And they were trying to like, they were bumping bars and really sketchy and like mm. almost crashing. So yeah, let me, instead, I want to say something about that. Oh, yeah. sorry. I, I just to, so everyone can know this, this downhill 
it's in the mountains and it's curvy and there's trees. So if a car's coming, you can't see. And what happens is it's so bunched up. It's like a Peloton on one side. When people cross a double yellow line and a car comes, they swerve into like 80, 100 people on the other side. That's what would have happened. And you could have a massive pile up going like, you go 35 miles per hour on that downhill, correct? Yeah. Like it oh, is. Yeah. yeah. And it is so much better to be in that group, sit up. I, I would have just to have my dropper down and just, yeah. And you might have to touch your brakes a bunch. So you get a little bit of space and everyone's going to do it because when you're in the back in that Peloton, you're going to descend faster because you don't have the wind resistance to people in the front. And yeah. normally you'd be able to go around and all that sort of stuff, but it's so, so dangerous to do that. Especially this is like three minutes into a five, six, yeah. seven hour race. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you no benefit also because it doesn't, the timing start, does the timing start the there? Timing. Or the time timing starts for the first lap technically at the start finish, but then they check your time also when you pass the lap yeah. point. So like, but the, so it's it not going to make a crazy. difference pretty much. Like, yeah. There's but it like could kill people. Big, tall Jeff Kabush. He's probably like six, four or so six, three and stands out. And also he's Jeff Kabush. So people just kind of like know who he is. And he even says like, Hey, all center or double center line. Do not cross that line. And they completely ignored him. So then, and everybody started flowing to the front and looking sketchy. So then after that, what all the pros did is it was Alex Wild and Levi Leipheimer at the front. And Dude, we all kind of, that's a crew. Yo, it was, it was a fast group. <laughs> and we had Sandy Florin, who's won grasshoppers and beaten Peter Stetna. We had this kid named Truman Glasgow from Utah that I don't even know if he's really been racing that long, but incredibly strong. Anyways, it was really cool. See, a name to so, watch. Yeah, very much. But everyone rolled over to the side and then they just like laid the gas on from the start, considering the coasting and everything else. Once we climbed up into onto the, where you go into the ski run, Nate, I was over 340 Watts already. So, and that's it weighing like 150 pounds. At so 7,000 feet or whatever. 7,000 feet. Yeah. So their answer, which was great, was just like, okay, well, if you're going to swarm the front, then keep up. And, uh, so they just ended up making the pace a lot faster for the first climb. I did 320 Watts for the first like 20 minutes. Cause it's like a 20 minute climb. And my threshold at that time is around like 310, 313, I think is what uh, AI FTP detection said right before the event. So that gives you an idea. Like I was over my limit for sure, but uh, I never once got caught behind somebody because I did that. And it also, I was, um, I was linked up with a junior rider from uh, his name is Matt's a really fast kid on the bear dev team who was just doing the 50 K. So I would pull in the flat stuff. And then he would just like, uh, make me die on the climbs and then, but it ended up working and I'd catch him on the flats. But it was really hard. I actually cramped, um, at the end of it, uh, like full VMO, both VMOs cramps, um, Is because bottle I, and a half of no, water? <laughs> I did two <laughs> bottles. <laughs> I did two bottles. I think that the reason that I cramped is looking back. Uh, so when you, when you peak really well, right, Chad, like back me up on this, like when you allow yourself to recover well and come into something really fresh and you can really push your limits on that day. Mm. It allows you to, to surpass things that you've done recently. Yeah, sure. You might see new heights. Yep. And I saw yeah. new heights because I did almost 280 Watts for two hours and 16 minutes. That's like, that's really high for me. Like really high, it's, way higher than anything I've done recently. Especially at that elevation. Yeah. And John though, you could have probably had a little more water. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was two hours and 16 minutes and I had two tall bottles. Uh, not the insulated ones, just two tall bottles. And I drank the bottles empty and I took two gels. So I did 120 grams an hour or 115 grams an hour. Um, and I drank it all. So I don't know. I think that it was timed out appropriately. I think I just, it was just a really hard effort. I was able to like surpass what I had done recently. It was really cool. It all worked out. Was, and then Ivy. I was laughing because I feel like I did a good job of hydrating and pacing and everything. But by the time I got to the last descent, I was so cooked. There's like a little <laughs> like flat roller section on that descent. And I had to sit down for just like a second because I was so cooked. <laughs> yeah. So you're not alone. Yeah. I did was 216 it? was my, uh, start to finish, but my goal remember was to do lap to lap and get as close to 210 as I could. And I did 209 on lap to lap. So super uh, happy with that. Yeah. But Ivy, your time was smoking fast. Thank you. Um, like I among think... the women's times, just, I, and I know that we were doing one lap, but still there's Katarina Nash and stuff there. So like, you know, Katarina's a legend, but still among the women's times, I think that you had a really like the top three time. 
Thanks. Yeah. Uh, you set such a fast first lap. I couldn't believe when you came in and I was waiting with the other relay folks and you showed up already. And I was like, what? <laughs> I think you were the like, 10th pro guy to come in or something. And I was like, Whoa, it's going to be lonely out there. And it was, um, so the only folks to pass me out there, there were like a couple amateurs, um, and Katarina Nash. And that was basically it. It was pretty lonely out there. So I had to, I didn't have much help pacing. Um, but yeah, you were, super, you were, you were super worried about a long effort and pacing it though. Weren't you? Because you're used to yeah. like cyclocross. So yeah, how'd I'm you used do to it? Just going absolutely ballistic for 50 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we had to, yeah, we, um, talked about my pacing strategy a lot and thought about my strengths on that course. And that's not, I didn't think it was going to be a good course for me because of the climbing and I'm not like my Watts per kilo, um, especially in the context of climbing, like not great, not a great climber. So I was super nervous, but, um, that course really seemed to favor kind of like powerful riders. It feels like the, the climbs are so steep and the descents are so drawn out that it's not like a super fast coasting, like ripping descent. You have to stay on top of the gear and keep pedaling. So that's really where I was able to put some time in. It would be funny that, um, folks would like catch me or almost catch me on a climb. And then we'd get to like a rolling single track section. I'd be like, yo, let me know when you want me to get out of the way. Like I'll move. And a couple of times guys would be like, no, no, I'm, I hurt. It's okay. Like <laughs> I'm hurting. I'll just stay right here. So it's like, oh, okay. This is a good, um, th this is a strength of mine. I get it. So I tried to lean into those sections and not cook myself on the climbs so that I could really put down power on the, like the pedally descents, if that makes sense. Um, and it, and it worked out and, um, had to stop at the last aid station and get another bottle, fill up a bottle and, um, douse myself with cold water, which felt amazing. And then that last climb is super hot exposed drag. And that was really like the only effort that I tried to, um, really expend everything on. It felt like the last effort and one of the more important ones, I didn't want to go into it tired. And so yeah, worked out. Okay. Super impressive. We beat all the, so we beat the only other co-ed relay team, but we also beat the just pure dude relay teams, which is great. So we beat them as well. I think the relay is the way to do that race. I mean, unless you're trying to qualify for Leadville, it was so much. I was going to ask you that having, having done it as a relay that doesn't qualify either of you because mm -hmm. does Leadville offer a relay? I know they have tandem, right? They don't. And it, Ivy and I were talking about that. Like, I think kind of cool. I don't know how they would do it, but <laughs> high yeah. five at Columbine. Yeah. And then, yeah. exactly. you know. But you don't get individual qualifications for it. Having done it as a relay. We don't that makes no. sense. Yeah. We saw I'm okay with that though. So. <laughs> yeah. You don't want that temptation presented. No, no. Yeah. There were 700 racers doing it. I think it was capped at 700 and, uh, I lost count at how many trainer road athletes and, and podcast listeners I spoke to after 70, I just quit counting. I was trying to like keep a tally. There were so many of you and it was so awesome to talk to you all and to see how many people are overcoming huge obstacles and personal goals and PRs and how many of you qualified for Leadville and some of, and all this is super cool. Maybe, uh, I won't use any identifying characteristics for these people because I don't know if it was perfectly okay, but at the same time, I think it's really kind of them. And I'm really glad it worked out. There was a whole crew that had qualified for Leadville, but one of their friends had not qualified for Leadville. He just missed the time that he needed, but it, it, but if it rolled down or sorry, if they were doing the random, like drawing where they put your, you put your number and then if they call your number, you get it. So that whole crew put their friend's number that didn't qualify on their sticks. And he did end up getting pulled and it was like, so cool. It's just it's a fantastic story. Um, and I'm really glad to see that there were so many of you and so many winners. We had winners in the junior categories that used trainer road to prepare for this winners in the senior categories, like across the, the, the board and Alex wild one, of course, uh, he did a fantastic job. It was just a really cool day. Um, I really like that. You say, of course, like Levi Leifheimer, Jeff Kabush, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, and I think uh, from what I heard, like Levi and Levi was really pushing him hard, but then Levi flatted and he couldn't get his wheel off because it was, um, he was messing around with the hub and everything else the day before, because he had to have something warrantied. And I think he tightened it too much. So with a tiny little multi-tool, he couldn't get his axle off. So he had oh. to like walk his bike with a flat 
slash ride it when he could till he got to an aid station where they had a bigger wrench to be able to, to get it off, which is a bummer. So, but more of course folks should do the relay finished. though. Yeah. Way more. Really it's so, so much awesome. fun. Yeah. It was a blast. I'm excited. Uh, I, I definitely want to do it again. Um, yeah, it's yeah, a good trying race. To get, I'm trying to get John to commit to next year already. He, he didn't say yes for sure yet. So I'm going to keep bothering him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do it. It sounds fun. I guess the real question is where it falls in relation to nationals. I wish they would move this race in terms of time frame so that it could be part of the lifetime grand prix, because I think racing wise, this would be a super exciting race to watch. Like you said, Nate, there's like, you know, there's funneling points to single track, but there's a lot of spots for open racing. And the course is really segmented. So it would encourage people to like attack or be aggressive in specific areas of the course. It's, it's pretty cool. Whereas Leadville is kind of more like wide open ish in a lot of ways. This has, is a bit more dynamic. It'd be really fun. So it'd be awesome. Anywho, it was a blast. Great to meet you all. Uh, well done to everybody at Tahoe trail 100. Let's get into Frederick's question. He says, in addition to the question about standing or seated climbs, this is a tricky one. I have a gentle short climb about 2.4% for 1.5 kilometers. So that's just under a mile. Um, and only 2.4%. So that's pretty, that's pretty gentle, right? Chad, no, that's not, it's nothing too steep. No, um, it's, it's, it's almost perfect conditions for trying to work on riding out of the saddle. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. It says when doing this climb seated or standing for the same time to complete the standing climb is about 30 Watts or 10% higher for me. I've tried this with three different bikes with three different power meters, all yielding the same results. And I can't wrap my head around what is happening. What can I be doing that makes me so bad at standing climbs training wise? It seems like standing is an effective way at training or to train at higher power. He probably means higher force. I don't know, but in racing, it seems to be very foolish to do anything, but sit down. I've tried various bikes, mountain bike, gravel and road power meters, two different cranks and sets of pedal, or one is a set of pedals. Another one's dual, and they're all dual sided. I also tried varying the cadence, but the power difference remains and it's stable between training sessions and doesn't deviate as a mountain bike rider. I'd like to be able to do standing efforts without feeling I'm slower doing them. That's a good, uh, good question. And a good one for us to kind of guess, because we probably don't have all the info that we need, right, Chad. Um, but at the same time, we can throw out some, some guesses and some ideas. to work with, and he's been clearly very thorough. Jeez. Yeah, no doubt. This brings to mind Pete, uh, Pete. Like, uh, so Brandon, our COO, incredibly strong athlete, uh, ex Terra age group world champion last year. And my partner at Cape Epic, uh, Brandon likes to stand a lot when he climbs and he does it to great effect because boy, he sure drops all of us. But, uh, Pete and Brandon always had this like rivalry. They would never compete on the bike unless it was like in a crit. Uh, but Pete would always kind of like joke at Brandon and be like, Oh, I guess it's too hard for you. I have to stand out of the saddle again. And <laughs> Pete's very much like a seated power is king sort of person. But I think that one of the reasons that seated power is king, and one of my hypotheses here as to why the power may be higher when he's standing is just because of aerodynamic loss that you have. So the aerodynamic efficiency that goes away when you stand, just increase your frontal area pretty substantially. Like let's take these points of reference. Specialized did a video with um on like a Leadville course comparison. And they used Howard Grot's speed, which is 16.7 miles per hour that he had at one point when he did this race. So that's 27 kilometers an hour. So to give you an idea of the differences in change of position, I know this is over hundred miles. So this is like six hours with Howie's pace, but, um, it gave you a 17 minute savings when you went from an upright MTB position. So this is sitting on the saddle, but just sitting normally versus one where you're just elbows are bent a little bit and you're hunching your upper body a bit that garnered 17 minutes savings. And it garnered 23 minutes savings when you took your hands and then just grabbed in toward the stem instead of holding onto the grips and those handlebars. So when you think about that, the, my point with this is that it's significant that aerodynamic savings does matter. And even on something that's as short as a mile long, in this case, depending on the wind conditions, of course, I could see that having an effect. Well, 2.4% two, gradient, that's almost a false flat. Like mm -hmm. this, I don't know, Frederick, how strong you are, but you'd be going 20 miles per hour and you stand up. Yeah. 10%, mm -hmm. maybe more. Another one that I know it's not the case in this situation, but for those who are mountain bikers, standing up in the, the loss of your uh, suspension is just soaking up those watts. And there are some bikes that lock out and stuff for that, but I know you said you've done it on gravel and road, but if it was just a mountain bike, that, that's, a, that's a thing, John, right? Especially if you have oh, yeah. more, more suspension. 
for sure. And if you have like, um, uh, really voluminous tires, right? Like really big 2.4s or something that are squishing a lot. I have to assume that there's some sort of power loss in there. I'm not sure, but uh, the, the other thing too, um, some people, so, uh, Ivy, uh, Ivy's like, uh, sorry, I'm going to make you blush, but you're kind of like a picture perfect technique rider. Like when you stand out of the saddle, you don't swerve Ooh, around. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't swerve around. You aren't like a wild rider. Uh, it's very like, uh, it's very, your, your technique solid. And there's two different ways to stand. Um, I always talk about how Chad's a steady rock on the bike. And when Chad gets out of the saddle too, he's also once again, a really good example of this, but you can stand and swerve and kind of be not disciplined and you will lose Watts if your bars are kind of flopping around left to right. And you're really swerving instead of just leaning your bike. Like you'll absolutely have some loss there. Um, I can't, you know, I can't help, but think that that would also contribute to it. So depending on the technique, once again, not saying that this is your situation, but I'm just pointing out some things that could be there. Um, Chad, I don't, I don't know if you agree on the stomping versus the, that sort of well, stuff swerving. Yeah. The swerving. And then I, I see stompers or lurchers, whatever you want to call it, where it's the same thing where they have these really high force moments that, that do tweak the, the muscle recruitment patterns. But in terms of costing more power to go the same speed, it, it, I think the force distribution around the revolution is coming at an unfavorable point. They're just stomping and putting out too much high force taxing particular fibers. And that's probably not really the concern, but the power increase for the same speed definitely is. So I do think it's coming down to technique and probably force distribution at again, points that just aren't serving the, you know, the, the need for forward movement. Instead, they're not, not even hemorrhaging power, just adding more power for the same speed. That's a frustrating thing. If we're saying that the power meter is reading correctly, Mm -hmm. Then it would be, and I, I've always wondered about this, those really like slow people who uh, yeah. do those stomps, it's constant accelerations. And so you slow down and then you accelerate. And that's only, not on this one, 2.4, but you've seen that on really steep stuff, right? It's like, yep. like they, they, they yeah. lurk. They almost go and backwards so, when they're transitioning between legs. Yeah. It feels it, like that. Yep. Yeah. And as Chad says, uh, same power for the same speed. If you had a constant acceleration, it's impossible, right? It would be the same speed. But because of, or... No acceleration. You know, no acceleration is constant acceleration, I guess, or I don't know. Scientists help me out, <laughs> but it's the uh, it's that accelerating that mass over and over again, where that sucks up that power, right? And especially if you're a heavier rider, it could be even more. So I think what Chad's point too is like, if you're a little more more smooth, you're not doing those little micro accelerations over and over and over again. It's going to be less watts. I don't know how many that is, but um, yeah, I still yeah, I think on this. That's a really good point, though, for just people to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a, just a perfect scenario that demonstrates what there is to gain by improving how biomechanically efficiently you push the pedals by, by how you can train yourself to ride as well out of the saddle as in the saddle. Yeah. There's going to be, you know, greater oxygen uptake, more muscles doing work. You know, you have to stabilize now because you're off the saddle. We talked about this last podcast, but you can get to a point where you, when you get out of the saddle, you ride really fluidly. You distribute power across the pedal stroke almost as well, maybe as well. In some cases, Brandon might be an example of this, uh, Keegan as well, where you do it almost as smoothly as when, when seated. Yeah. The, you know, the one thing that kind of adds some, uh, in, in my mind increases my confidence that the power meter thing could be there is thinking about how power meters react to oval rings. So, and, and I think that some power meters claim to account for this. So I'm not saying every power meter is this way, but I know from personal experience and using different power meters and putting oval rings on, and this is commonly known that oval rings can inflate power data. Uh, so, I mean, even Chris Froome and team sky have talked about this, how they've, they've had to deal with this as well. The reason for that is because it can kind of like spike the power, the, the force that you put in the torque that you're putting into it because of the oval ring, depending on where it's clocked, it can spike that. And then as a result, it kind of like artificially like drags the average up almost, if that makes sense. And then as a result, your power readings can be, uh, inflated. So I almost wonder there could be a situation and I don't know, power meter, uh, manufacturers would really have to give us their insight if they even know on this one. But maybe if you're really surgy, you're a stomper, like Chad is saying, if that's the case, perhaps you're causing something similar to what happens to, uh, overeating with oval rings, but that's purely a guess. That's definitely, uh, that's me like, uh, hop, skip and a jump, you know, um, Ivy, how, how about you? Like, 
have you noticed this anecdotally for you, um, standing versus seated because of cyclocross, you kind of do a bit of, you have to do both, but yeah, for sure. And I know that Frederick wants to, as a mountain bike rider, feel better doing standing efforts, but this scenario, um, two to 4% for a long distance like that is not the kind of scenario in which I would think being out of the saddle is the most efficient. And for me, um, in that kind of setting, like controlled low grade, being out of the saddle doesn't feel faster for me. Um, it doesn't feel, and like Frederick obviously is understanding that they're producing more power when they're out of the saddle, but that doesn't mean that it's the most efficient, um, or the quickest. So for me, I feel like when I'm seated in that kind of two to 4% false flat scenario, um, I feel like I have better muscle recruitment like comprehensively when I'm able to stay seated. So there are like really mm -hmm. different circumstances, especially off-road where it's super steep or loose or technical or weird, where you want to feel comfortable getting out of the saddle. Um, and it is better and more efficient, especially in like shorter or steeper instances. But I don't think that this is one of those instances where you would need to feel comfortable getting out of the saddle. And I think this one too, Frederick is saying it's 2.4%. I think they're oh, from so Europe. more so. Yeah, yeah. because oh, it's wow. the, uh, they wrote 1.5 kilometers, but with a comma. I think that's France mm -hmm. and a couple other countries. So yeah. Is Frederick a researcher? I think a sign. Like, I appreciate the curiosity. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's, I would, I would bet money is just aerodynamics. Um, and you think you're going slow. And even at like 16, I remember um, uh, from the best bike split guy, he was saying that at 16 miles per hour, or was it 14? That's when maybe like you can like sit up. You don't want to be over. There's still aerodynamic loss. 13. 14. Yeah. 13 14. is typically where things start to, they say like the aerodynamic threshold. And yeah. I think when you use best bike split, it sets up like you can set your own parameters for this, but it basically says like, when do you want to indicate that you would be out of the saddle at what speed? And it has 14 as like the one that it suggests. Yeah. So 2.4 though. I mean. You guys have probably gone 25 miles per hour on 2.4, right? Especially uh -huh. if it's a, a mile long and you're going all oh, out. Yeah. So, so imagine, imagine you're in a Peloton and you're standing up <laughs> at 24 yeah. miles per hour. That's yeah. going to be hard, 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 That's hard. That's a you huge increase in frontal over. area. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it's like an increase in frontal area. That's even more, uh, uh, damaging to your aerodynamic efficiency than others, because you're not just standing, you're typically standing up and posturing up quite a lot as well. Like you're spread out. Yeah. Yeah, um, down you also, sprinting. yeah, you also tend to be a bit, uh, so like if you think of a hole, like the Looney Tunes hole that you would cut, if you blew through a wall or something, you know, like, <laughs> and you think of the silhouette that you would cut when you're out of the saddle, you move a lot and your bike moves a lot. So there's, uh, mm -hmm. and we talked about this back when we were doing wind tunnel or sorry, um, uh, doing velodrome testing. And we were testing our aerodynamic efficiency about how a person that, that wags when they pedal and that it has a noisy body and not a quiet and still body effectively increases their frontal area. Because if you were to, you know, blur it over a second and you were to measure their frontal area, it's actually wider than just their body because their body is moving side to side. And when you stand, you're, you're a lot less reverent with your body position, right? Like you can move all around and, and, and that's likely going to cause even more drag. Imagine if you're tall too, even more. Totally. Mm -hmm. Speaking of tall, uh, Nate, I don't know. You typically don't watch the, the world cups, but, uh, David Valero, the Spanish rider, He's, I think, six six. He's really tall. Whoa. He got third, I believe, at Tokyo. Um, Jeez. So and he's like, uh, but anyways, he got third again at a World Cup this weekend. And I saw his dropper post, and the commentators were indicating that, like, oh, you should see his dropper post. It's huge. He's got a lot of drop. He probably has like a fifty mil drop. Fifty. Wow. How crazy is that? Because with I, with and his seat post is so high, you know, just like yeah. yours, because what, he's such ran? long legs. I think he rides for, oh, I could be wrong, but I think it's BH. It's that uh, brand that's popular over in Spain. Yeah. I think too, it has to do a lot with, uh, especially if you get really tall with how long your legs are compared to your upper body to your arms. Because if your mm -hmm. legs are, if your inseam's a little less and it's more upper body, like Michael Phelps is that way, right? It's mostly upper and less legs. Um, and then you still have long arms like Michael Phelps. You're, you're kind of angled back, right? But if you're the totally. opposite and you have really long legs and you're even more steep uh, and it can be very it's very hard then to get behind the saddle where like I could not get behind my saddle, which was crazy when it was all yeah. the way up. It was impossible. But if you are short legs and long arms, 
it's possible then you have like extra suspension in your arms to get behind it, um, especially with a 50 millimeter drop. But yeah, that, that's not much at all. 50 millimeters. No, for... it's so tiny. Yeah, like it's like a road drop. So good. He's it's just like a so good. Drop. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I mean, riders at that road level drop. are just like a totally different level to be able to. And he, his descending speed is spot on. It's not like he suffers. You know, it's just. I like. It's really special. impressive. I know, right? It's got to be 500, huge. 500, like. Yeah, probably. Right. I mean, Matt Beers, yeah. I think, is 500, and he's really yeah. tall, the yeah, South African rider. So I think he's six five. That's like, yeah. that's when it gets into a problem. You can't eat enough. Like, <laughs> like, like you burn short too events. Much. You're 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 relegated to short events. Yeah, you just can't this fuel for long ones. Yeah, this is why I've always thought that uh, the larger so these these outliers, these 500 watt, six four, six five, six six, like 198, 200 centimeters, who are maybe rowers or cyclists all this power, are they really limited to the same carbohydrates as other people who are, mm. who's a five foot four, um, woman who's 120 pounds, right? Like, the intestine size is different, right? The surface area of the stomach, um, mm. all this stuff. And I think it's really hard though, to study those people because they are very rare. Like there's totally, not many yeah. in the world. Like you don't get don't know, an, like an accurate, like, you probably won't even get like an accurate representation because they're just the pointiest end of the spear too, you know? Yeah. But I think what it would tell you then is if, you, you know, you got some of the smallest people that are pro athletes mm -hmm. and then some of the like highly trained, right. They've trained to, to take as much as they can. And then the other side, and I would like to see what the difference is between there, because if there is like a difference, then maybe you could fill it in and look at some more people and see if there's a line mm -hmm. like inside mm -hmm. of that. Uh, absolutely. I, I, they need to recruit the, the highest level athletes at the extreme ends of the anthropomorphic spectrum. So they get the, the smallest athletes and the largest athletes and do a comparison because if it exists between those extremes, then they can get finer and finer, more granular and see, yeah. does it exist at you know slighter differences? But if it doesn't, I'd be like, okay. But then I would think too, that these large riders, like on these really long events, they're going to be having to, Matthew Beers is a great example at Cape Epic. And he's, um, you know, like muscle size, um, has to do with glycogen too. He's, he's a slim, slim, slim guy. Yeah, you would think is. for him yeah. to have enough glycogen, like to be repeated every day for those like five yeah. hour stages and be able to eat enough. It would just be a math thing where he would, it would not work. Right. Like right. <laughs> he would not be able to eat enough. It would just run out every time. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knows how much he eats or what he said he eats, which is, yeah. that's a big thing too. Like mm -hmm. I, I said this before, but, uh, we know a lot of pro athletes and there is a, it doesn't, it's not in their best interest to say specifically what they eat all the time about the exact strategy. I know some people come in the podcast that have been very honest, but in general, other people, um, I, I don't, I've never heard of someone doing this, but I have a theory that some world tour team people have said inaccurate things on purpose to mm -hmm. mess with their competition or they yes. take pictures of meals and they're like, no carb day. This is the way yeah. to do it. In the like, middle if of you were, the tour. <laughs> yes. If you were going to mess, I'm thinking of one with like Chris Froome. If you yeah. were going to mess with your competition, right? And like, yeah. no one knows how you're doing this and your brand is science. And there's a trend of people thinking that's, that's good. I would, I mean. I think it was like an egg, avocado and salmon. And he was like, uh, yep. no carb had a, day in the middle of the tour. And he had a chart Terry juice, like a uh, uh, sachet. Yeah there too yeah. like this is it <laughs> tart cherry juice 100 that works just kidding yeah I know. Uh, it's delicious um you know man, i haven't you know had that I'm, for a while i gotta buy some you know what i'm really Excuse interested me. in seeing uh, yeah nate's gonna go to the store he'll be back um uh, <laughs> with it uh the tour de france femmes seeing that i would love so like we have i hope the journalists go as in depth with the tour de france femmes as they do with the men's race because how fascinating would it be? Because we've had that before where um, journalists have been given access to a team or something like that, and they've documented what they eat. And that's how we've figured out that like Team Sky or EF, that they're eating like, you know, 13 gram. what was it? 13 grams of carbs per uh, kilogram of body weight, like in the per middle day. of the stage it, per day or in the middle of the, the race. And that's like mind blowing when you start actually thinking of how much food it's that actually day. is. Yeah. You yeah. can't be in the race. Cause that would be, yeah, it's, it's stressed yeah, out over yeah. the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, over the day. So I, but I, I would love to see, but some, yeah, crazy like that. It's, it's really Wouldn't high. it be interesting though, to see if there's differences with the, the women's teams and yeah. to see if there's intention behind those differences as well. Like, and that, that would be because I think that there is not a lot known 
and I'm, but this might resonate with you, Ivy, I don't know, but there is not a lot known about the top woman performers in our sport. Like we, we, we get press coverage about what the men do, but we don't get a whole lot of press coverage about what the women do. And it'd be really interesting to see the difference. Yep. That's pretty accurate. We yeah. do have Amber, <laughs> which is yeah. nice because she was there and like yeah. was like saw world champions and stuff. And one thing she did say though is the um, this is a few years and hopefully it's changed is the pressure for her to be like super light to eat less carbs mm -hmm. and be a specific body type and look where we've seen world championship women. There's no specific body type, like mm -hmm. um, it goes it goes all over the place. And with men, they're Mm, a certain disciplines, it kind of like goes to a certain one, but woman, it's not that case at all. And I hope then that there's been more research since she was racing professionally that she will eat that high car. I mean, they, they're all eating high carbs. They want to, um, they're not like trying to lose weight in the middle of a stage. And yeah, the trend uh, is work. very much in the direction of indiv individualized nutrition. And that's where everything's headed. It's all the rage and it's the rage, not because it's a fad, but because it's necessary. They're recognizing that if you properly nourish athletes, if you individualize that nutrition, you can take a grand tour athlete, bring them into a race at a particular weight, nourish them appropriately over the course of it and have them exit that race at the same weight so that they don't take that same recovery hit so that they obviously very well manage their nutrition across 21 really hard days of racing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's that idea it's too, exciting. that what Chris Froome, they, they had to like, they tried to drop his weight for a certain stage and all that sort of stuff. Yep. I mean, it worked once, but it didn't work many other times. Yeah, uh, it's, crazy, on that. it's, it's, I, that's a, that's a very fine line to draw. And I would not recommend that for amateurs. Um, yeah. I said, you, you train, you do all this stuff and to mess it up is so easy. Um, so many things that could be an issue too. I'm, I, I would love to see how much carbohydrate and I would like the in nutrition intake of Bob Van Aert in particular, mm -hmm. he spent so much time at the front of this darn tour. I don't get it. Like, I don't know how he has been able to, at the mountain stages, at the sprint stages, at the TTs, he's at the front. Like every single time, but there, he has to be burning so much. There's a common oversight and, and it's, well, it's common. And it's, it may be how much we can credit it considering this type of work that Wild Van Art's doing versus the work that people do when they sit in the Peloton or aren't quite as active as he mm. definitely influences how much fat you're metabolizing. So, so there, we don't just metabolize carbohydrate, fats in play yeah. also, which you know I'm using for a segue into our next question. <laughs> Well done, Chad. Uh, Gabrielle says, and I, and I hope it's Gabrielle. I apologize if not. Love, uh, love everything you're doing at Trainer Road. I started using Trainer Road after having a baby because I no longer had the luxury of just riding whenever and however I wanted. Despite having less time to ride, I'm stronger than ever. It's almost like structured training works, <laughs> Gabrielle says. Wow. Uh, my, favorite, my favorite workouts are when I have a new episode of the podcast to listen to. That's awesome. Warms my heart, uh, especially because... I mean, quite literally any moment right now, uh, we could be having a baby, uh, which is just crazy. Um, which actually want to set, I want to be able to set expectations on that. Um, I'm going to be taking paternity leave. So I will be off the podcast for about a month after the child's born. So you're going to get a round Robin of unique experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. Nate might host Chad might host Ivy might There's host. There's no mites about it. Okay. <laughs> Chad's the first host. Just so you know, don't miss it. It's going to be, it could be next episode, right? Next Thursday. I could. Chad's yeah, gonna host it, man, and Ivy and I are gonna be here, and we are not gonna step in at all. Well, I'm just crossing my arms, and let him handle it with his gravitas. I'm just watching that ship sink. No, no. I, I think when you ask us a question, it's just yes or no, Ivy. We just say yes, no, uh, or I don't know, and let him take the rest. We'll just lean back. Uh, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, we'll be, we'll have be, it pre. Yeah, they are gonna be pre-recorded. I was just gonna say that. So that allows two things. Number one. That allows uh, that allows us to mess up and and to not worry about it. The other thing that that allows is that it allows us to record at happy hour, right, Chad? Um, which uh, the could, goal. Be, could be <laughs> could be <laughs> beneficial, <laughs> uh, or it could sink our ship. Uh, we, I guess we'll find out. So this <laughs> is a two a ninety minute beers with Chad, yeah, <laughs> but with science, That's like terrible. Yeah. science. Uh, that, that's way too much time to devolve. We're we're going yeah. downhill. It's way too much time. <laughs> Got to close the, the window. John, are you scared about your job at all? 
<laughs> it's gonna be like a we're gonna have three thousand people live listening and uh, uh be... i'm scared about the impacts of the company but also yeah. i'm not scared about the job because all i want to do is just elevate train road and have more people listen more people get faster and i think that if we have uh chad uh on there i think people are gonna love it if we have ivy on doing it i think people will love it so john yeah. you just do more of those like that sprint training video and the uh blood flow restriction yeah if you guys haven't seen them they have hit and you get like so much information in like eight minutes it is oh, yeah concise and it, it's hard to do right like it cuts it up oh, really yeah. well and you learn stuff and there's takeaways uh we want to do more of these you've got a good uh we've got a really good response lots of comments questions and just keep getting better at it so i mean yeah so chad They're you could awesome. do the podcast and john could just do that full time there we are one a uh, day john <laughs> yeah, but oh, yeah, John's plus gone. john does like a thousand other things at trainer road too just so you know <laughs> that's true but, yeah but the podcast dynamic is i don't know it's not hinged on his attendance but he's definitely a contributor yeah he is a contributor no uh i'm yeah. just joking on all this like <laughs> we're gonna it's gonna be interesting and people are gonna be like oh i'm glad john's back it's gonna be wild i can't yeah. wait for it it'll be great um <laughs> big wait, collective chad, sigh can, of relief <laughs> chad ivy can we be can we say that we'll be in the live chat thursday morning yeah, so when sure. people want to chat with us like because it's going to be so it'll be premiered and it'll act like it's live Oh, but we'll be in the chat and we can talk to people um, sure. at mm -hmm. that same time and answer questions and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's e there's even That's a chance idea. that we may have a special guest come on and do an in person podcast. Ooh, who could it be? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay, I'm going to keep reading Gabrielle's question. She says, in episode 369, you were discussing fat oxidation and encouraging Richard to increase his carb consumption to be able to work at higher intensities and ultimately go faster. And by the way, I didn't lean into talking about fat quite yet with the last question, even though abs or last discussion, even though it's absolutely something that we should discuss because of this question. So there's some of you that were probably, especially the folks that are big fans of fat adaptation, they're probably screaming at like the device that you were listening to this on wanting us to talk about that. We're going to talk about it now. You briefly mentioned that this would be different for ultra distances. And as I'm training for an ultra event, 200 or 2000 kilometers solo, not 200 unsupported bike packing event. This left me wondering in what way would it be more beneficial for ultra distance athletes, which by the way, Gabrielle, uh, kudos for taking on such a big challenge. Uh, she says, yeah, right. Crazy. If I'm training for ultra distance, is there benefit in doing some long, slow rides in a fasted state to encourage fat adaptation? Or is the theory that even if there are carbs, you're always burning fat and training efficiency. So it's better to fuel the work so you can recover better and do more work. Thanks to your podcast, I have been increasing the amount of carbs I consume on the bike and have found my performance and recovery improving significantly. But with an ultra event in mind, I'm now wondering if I should be training my gut towards something a bit different. Thanks again for everything you're doing from Gabrielle. Chad, take it away. Okay, first off, hello, Gabrielle. Hope you're having a good workout as you listen to this. <laughs> uh, as, as I, The question you're asking is, should I, as an ultra endurance athlete, pursue fat adaptation. And if, if ever there were a good use case for this wackadoo dietary intervention, this would be one of them. I see perhaps <laughs> cancer <laughs> as another. Chad, Chad, just, sorry, you, you like absolutely smashed the hornet's nest with the baseball bat right there. Yeah, I like to thing. throw gas on the fire and yeah. kick off each of these. <laughs> Get everyone's attention. No, <laughs> yeah. People message me directly when this happens yeah. well that's another yeah. side benefit of me it's saying things like that yeah. <laughs> they get pissed though it's it's like religion yeah, uh, yeah man di yeah, di diet like, cults book by matt we'll Fitzgerald, go studies Apple back and in, yeah we'll go yeah. studies back and or i don't know I, we'll, no you can mess with anything but you mess with people's okay. nutrition and you raise some hackles this is this yeah. is undeniable <laughs> okay so no there, there's absolutely cause for it it suits certain instances if there are instances where it's appropriate i do believe this is one of them but i want to offer some caution and i'm going to do so by basically taking a little tour de burke so louise burke in particular because she's been a very vocal not proponent opponent just a a member of the research community who has contributed a lot on this topic and she's subjective and she continues to fight the good fight okay so we'll go back a couple decades to a paper that she wrote with john holly which basically got our hopes up with the promise of increased fat oxidation after a very short-term dietary modifications we're not talking about the whole you know it's going to take 30 days 60 days 90 days depending Rather, they use five to six days 
of a high fat diet where you know, it was comprised 60 to 70% of fat. And then they followed it by one to two days of high carbohydrate. So effectively carbo loading where the diet was comprised of 70 to 80% carbohydrate. They termed this fat audit, fat adaptation, carbohydrate restoration protocol. And it led to substantially higher rates of fat oxidation and improved muscle glycogen sparing. All, all things we want at submaximal intensity. So riding well below FTP. Uh, what's more, the fat oxidation rates actually persisted even when high carbohydrate meals were consumed prior to competition and or glucose drinks were consumed during competition. So on paper, this is everything we want as endurance athletes, especially ultra endurance athletes. I am uh, Ironman competitors come to mind, but all sorts of challenges. This, this bikepacking adventure is one of them. I thought so Chad everything was going to say, I am one of them. But anyway, so everything we'd want, however, they didn't find a performance benefit. So, so mm -hmm. this is the first chink in the armor, um, flash forward a couple of decades. And, and again, like I said, Louise Burke is still at it. This is a paper from 2020 with a number of colleagues, and it helps us understand why first, why, why there wasn't a performance benefit first the increased fat oxidation essentially translates to decreased aerobic efficiency, right? So there's more oxygen cost, greater oxygen cost for the same pace, for the same power output, for the same speeds. So the translation is that it, it tanks your aerobic efficiency, which is potentially, potentially problematic for anyone with less than stellar VO2 max. Second, regarding the carbohydrate restoration part of the, part of the protocol, yep, fat at uh, fat oxidation did remain elevated, but at what cost? Because basically the athletes faced a shift in substrate metabolism. They basically traded fat oxidation for carbohydrate oxidation. So because, and I say this because even in the face of ample carbohydrate availability, you know, prior and during carbohydrate oxidation rates only return to uh, their very specific 61 to 78%. Well, let's just call it between 60 and 80%, depending on the race intensity of their pre dietary modification carbohydrate oxidative capabilities. They became incapable of burning the same amount of carbohydrate. Is that a favorable trade? That's, that's certainly arguable. So again, this was due to short term fat adaptation, carbohydrate restoration. So, and, and I just want to restate that they traded fat oxidation for carbohydrate oxidation. They didn't supplement it as many of us had hoped, all of which led to reduced, reduced performance outcomes. So not on, on top of all this, they actually got you know, less faster, longer completion times. And then I'll, I'll wrap this up with a very recent review from 2021 by Burke alone, where she confirms a few of these points and she actually adds some further considerations. First, ketogenic or fat adaptation may impair the muscle's ability to use glycogen for oxidative fates. And I think this is a point that's lost on many because when we hamper our carbohydrate oxidative capabilities, our anaerobic capabilities, we also hamper the downstream aerobic metabolism of the byproducts that that anaerobic metabolism produces. So anaerobic metabolism produces energy, right? We break carbohydrate down, we get some energy release, but it also produces pyruvate and, and it's lactate intermediary. And that is then metabolized in the mitochondria aerobically. So if there's less of it produced, well, there's less of it available. And then Athletes say, but my discipline doesn't involve any high intensity efforts. Well, her, her second observation is that even with moderate intensity work, individual responsiveness to ketogenic, low carbohydrate, high fat diets is varied in her words with extremes at both ends of the performance spectrum. So essentially it's highly subjective. You know, some people excel, some people suffer, which leads her to a, a very important conclusion is that any endurance athlete who's contemplating any high fat dietary strategy. And again, her words should undertake an audit of event characteristics and personal experiences. You know, what's necessary in my events, what has history shown me about me nutritionally, all with the intention of mitigating the risk of poor performance. Hmm. So this, uh, Chad, uh, I'm going to take a crack at summarizing what I learned there is that when you go through a, like a high fat, fat adaptation goal based diet, and that's what you're going for, that there are, there are different effects than just making you more reliant upon fat, less reliant upon carbohydrate, particularly when you're looking at performance. In other words, it can make it so that you can't burn as many carbohydrates and you need to, to drive better performance. And it can also cause other issues with 
Yeah. So it seems like it, it comes with the exchanges you know, yeah, you metabolize less of your glycogen, but that might be because you're capable or you're incapable of metabolizing the amount of glycogen glucose that you used to be able to. So again, it's, it's a shift. It's not that by improving my fat oxidation, I'm now burning more fat on top of the carbohydrate I was already burning, but rather I'm burning more fat, but at the expense of some of the carbohydrate, my body used to be able to metabolize. Anecdotally, I feel like I, I, I recognize this, but that doesn't mean much. That's just me saying this, I guess, just pointing to the point of Dr. Burke here and saying that you need to analyze your own experience and to look at your event demands and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I certainly have to, my body has to get used to burning carbohydrate, uh, a bit more. And, and that's like a part of what I do to be able to prepare for higher races or higher intensity races in particular that I typically do. But once again, I'm no bike packer. Um, there's also like. 2000 mile or sorry, 2000 kilometer bike packing trip, Ivy, you're probably just not, I mean, you can't carry that food with you from the start. You're going to have to, you're going to be relying upon gas stations or whatever else you can find. Right. Exactly. And that's why when Gabrielle mentioned, should I be training my gut towards something different? I thought about this so much on that, uh, La Sierra bike packing trip I did with the squid folks recently, that was shorter than what Gabrielle will do four days and, um, I think 24, 25 hours total or something. But we had to rely upon gas station trash. And I was so, I thought about this during the trip, so grateful that my gut is adapted to trash. I think like <laughs> yesterday, or couple, no, for real, <laughs> after a group ride the other day um, with some buddies, uh, I got exposed or poked fun at because they were like, oh yeah, most riders like, oh, that gel hurt my tummy. And Ivy's like, I took six beer hand ups during the travel cross race that I won. So like, <laughs> my, being uh, able and ready to eat gas station, high calorie food is going to be so important. And I'm so glad that I was ready for that because man, on such a long trip, you're going to need to pick the most calorie dense, uh, stuff you can find at those gas stations. And with that comes a lot of weird ingredients and unfamiliar flavors and, you have to just um, be excited about putting it down the hatch. Otherwise you'll, you'll fall apart. <laughs> so yeah. what does training like that look like getting gas station trash on your normal training rides? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that you make a good point though. It's they, uh, people do this in Ironman all the time. They learn what the nutrition is going to be on the course and they use that in, in uh, competition. Uh, I don't know if Ironman is still sponsored by it, but they were sponsored by Gatorade for a while. It was high endurance and so people would buy, this is why Gatorade did it, would buy Gatorade High Endurance, which is the same Gatorade with more um, uh, salt in it. And they knew that uh, maybe that wasn't the most optimal for them, but on race day, that's what they're going to have. So they better get used to it because you don't want the opposite. You get used to one thing the whole time and then different flavor profiles, different uh, fructose mm -hmm. to glucose, uh, glucose um, ratios. It could be very hard. And what we see here inside of fat adapted athletes I think the one of athletes that people always point to are ultra endurance runners. They're doing hundred miles plus, right? And as of, I'm not sure about recently, I'm not really, um, up on it, but in, the, in the recent modern times, people have won that being fat adapted and, and had great success. Matt Fitzgerald talks about it in his, the endurance diet book. And he actually though special, uh, he not specializes, he theorizes that it's no shame to any of these people, but it's a new sport and not a lot of people do it. And if there were more people into it and more people try different things, there might be carbs might also win in that case. There's another caveat that of running is digesting 120 grams of carbs per hour running is much different than cycling. Um, cycling is way easier to eat a lot. And all the triathletes here know this, like it's, it's super hard to like eat bars and gels while you're running. We're just, uh, I mean, uh, Coke is probably you know, easy to digest and been pretty popular flat Coke on a race in this kind of thing, 1200 miles. Um, you guys all alluded to it food, right? There could be a, there could be a, a situation where you actually don't have food. Like there might not be gas stations. We don't know what this is. And if your food is limited and you cannot do it, I think fat adaption is a, a fantastic choice. If you know, you're not gonna be able to carry the amount of food or it's going to be 40 pounds of food or something like that, or you're going to go long stretches without food, because that's one of the benefits of fat adaption is you don't have to eat during this long stretch. And, um, two, if you're not racing, you just want to finish it. You might feel great the whole time doing it. You might not go as fast, but 
I mean, compared to not eating, we all know what a bonk feels like. You're yeah. less likely to bonk. Uh, but if you do have food and you've been training this way, and the thing about it too is when you when you do this, as Chad alluded to, like it is actually Dr. Podrakar did a really good uh, story on this recently. Somebody said like you can't get faster, increase your fat oxidation, and lose weight. Like he's they said get two. And, yeah, and pick two Podrakar, out of the three. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. he's like, no, you can do all three. And he gave examples because he. You know, he runs studies on people. I think he has people on a machine almost every day where you can <laughs> get faster, you increase uh, fax oxidation, and you can lose weight. And how he said you would do that is um, you can uh, you can either raise your threshold and that increases your the, the amount of um, grams of fat per minute you're burning at that same intensity. So if you're at 300 watt threshold, and I don't know what the amount is, but whatever you burn at 150 watts for fat, if you go from 300 to 320, you're burning more fat at that three at that uh, um, 150 watts because it's a yeah. lower percentage of your threshold. So that's one way to do it. And then to lose weight is a it is a caloric deficit during the day, and then you can get faster by fueling as you, you ride. And he's like, yeah, see, this is the combination. And we see athletes do this all the time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we've done this personally in our own experiences with uh, Dexas on in Trainer Road. So yeah. if you are Gabriel, like you're training the, especially if you have room to raise in your threshold and you can eat food and you're, you're okay eating food and you're, you're training this way, I would continue to eat food. And I mean, while you're training, just in general eat food, that's good, good tip in general. Everyone should eat some food. <laughs> if you haven't heard, uh, it's pretty important, but as you like, you mentioned yourself, you've eaten more food and you have uh, better recovery and you've increased your power. And on this race, you could like, let's say you go all fat adapt, adapt, fat adapted, but do you really get that? You limited your threshold increase by 20, 30 Watts. Like it's, it's a trade off that I don't personally like Op opposite. Let's say you're five Watts per kilo. You're not going to get any better. You're doing this really long race. Um, you enjoy being fat adapted, eating those fat foods, and you're not going to eat a lot of food during it, or your stomach really can't handle anything. That would be a great choice. Like, yeah, this is a, this is one of those ones where it could go either way. Um, but I don't think though, that one is like the fat adaptogen is necessarily going to be faster for everybody. So everyone should do it. it you yeah. could totally be just as fast or faster the other way. And I don't really know which one's the better one. Could I share like, uh, uh, along the suggestions of Dr. Burke to weigh your personal, uh, your, your personal situation, right. And to figure figure out which one you'll do. And thinking back to the successful athletes podcast with Angela Chang, she did a cross BC, a bike packing trip that she did. And that course was required her to spend a lot of time at a higher percentage of her threshold than you would anticipate for like a really long bike packing route. Because if you think a really long route, you anticipate, okay, so you take it easy because it's so long, but if there's steep climbs constantly, or if you're dealing with really sandy conditions, or in this case, they were riding, um, on like old railroad tracks. And in a lot of cases, it was kind of like Rocky. So it was constantly dealing with like little rocks, all those things make it so that you just raise the amount of power you have to put out just to get down that or get up that road and to move from point A to point B. So if you are in a situation where you could actually theorize roughly like, all right, this doesn't have that much climbing. And as a result, I'm not going to be forced to be above my threshold or even using high percentages of my threshold as I'm riding, then heck yeah, that's when I would want to look more toward fat adaptation. If it's a situation where you are going to be spending a lot of your time above threshold or at a higher percentage of your threshold on these big climbs, that's when you really want to prioritize raising your FTP as much as possible beforehand. So then that way, when you get there, those things take a smaller chunk away from your threshold. You know, it's just less relative work to that because that's just, um, that, I mean, that's, that's a good way to make a bike packing trip impossible is if you're having to, every climb is pushing you over your threshold, you know, that that's, that's, that's <clears throat> really tough. That's a really valuable point too, because uh, I think a lot of people class themselves as a particular type of athlete. I'm ultra endurance. I only do Ironman. I only do. But let's just say, let's just stick with that. I only do Ironman triathlons. Well, you have to consider the characteristics of the course. First off, a rolling course versus a flat course is going to exert 
different demands on the athlete. And then how are you going to ride those? Are you going to, you know, kill the hill and then sail on the, on the returns or the downhills? Are you going to stay even Steven as steady as possible the whole time? Are you going to do this with your dietary uh, approach in mind? Because you have to, I mean, you're not going to be able to go full gas up climbs, knowing that you're going to coast the recovery because for whatever reason that helps you run, or it, it just makes the bike course more uh, palatable, whatever it is all those things have to be weighed together. You know, you can say, I am an Ironman triathlete. I only go long and slow. So I'm going to go fat adapted. I'm going to, you know, bump up the fat content on my diet and not worry so much about carbohydrate, try to gain some of that type of adaptation, but then I'm going to go out and race a hilly course by really trying to drill the climbs and then fall apart halfway into the bike. So you can't just class yourself one way and expect that there's a diet that's going to perfectly suit that. This is, uh, and also maybe with Ironman training, and I know uh, we're talking about bike packing here too, but maybe Ironman training in particular is a spot where our experience decouples from the pros pretty heavily, uh, particularly maybe even if you look at like half Ironman, the, the percentage of FTP that these top athletes are holding is astounding mm -hmm. and they're still able to run so fast. And so some of them have, have potentially done that because they've elevated their, their aerobic capabilities to a point where they can just do that. I mean, that, yeah. and they're exceptional, but they definitely exist, but others do it because they're nourishing, but they're, they, they have a really high aerobic capacity. They can metabolize a lot of fat at higher intensities, but they're also supplementing with a heck of a lot of carbohydrate came into it, loaded on carbohydrate. So they're addressing yeah. both sides of it. Yeah. If I'm racing short track, for example, like my pacing plan, the numbers will look substantially different, but my pacing plan is probably going to be pretty similar to like a pros. In other words, we're just going to pedal until our eyeballs fall out. Right. But when you look at Ironman training, that's a, it's a bit different. Like it, it can, it, it's raced a bit differently. Uh, when you look at what an age grouper might do just an average age grouper versus the top elite of the field, you know, they're, they're just so, so uh, impressive and specialized with that. So is good. I feel like this is good advice. What I'm getting from this is that you have to consider the fact that there are drawbacks and that metabolizing carbohydrate is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. Metabolizing fat is also a good thing, but they aren't a system of switches. Uh, but instead it's a system of faders and you should weigh the different constraints that you're going to have uh, with your goal, whether that's a race or whether that's a ride, whatever it might be and find the best approach to do it. And as Ivy said, don't just show up to your event with like, okay, now that I'm doing the event, I'm going to just take on a totally fresh take on how to fuel myself. Cause that's going to mess your gut up big time when it matters most. So, uh, cool. Next question. This one's from Ken it says, Hey, TR coaches. I'm in the build phase of my very first trainer road plan builder, 12 week grand Fondo plan with an a race being in August. And it's going to be a hundred mile day. Prior to trainer road, I did an FTP test and measured 260. Then AI FTP popped me down to 257 and then back up to 259. I'm on a low volume plan, but actually doing medium and high volume when you include my unstructured weekend rides. So some sort of blend in between the two. That's a common approach that we suggest for people to get in their interval training, but then also get in their riding that they have. So my question is about progression levels and RPE. Sometimes I feel like I nailed a workout and then my levels don't change. And other times it feels hard and I actually move up. Should I be disappointed when I complete a workout and no progression levels increase and said, I mean, then, even more, I'm disappointed in you. Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ken does, Ken does mention on the flip side. I love seeing progressions jump at the end of the workout. If I feel strong, uh, and then I'm going to have some, or actually Nate, do you want to take that question on first? And then we can go into the other ones after this. Yeah. This one's so got you written all over it progression levels, it, they are, you know, it uses math to figure out a, exactly how hard different workouts are relative to each other. So if you go from a five to a 5.2, a 5.2 is harder than a five, like mathematically it is. And we back this up then with data to show failure rates and, and all this other stuff to validate that this these lines that we made are accurate. Um, it is, uh, it would be wonderful if every single workout we did, you got like you, you increased, right? Cause <laughs> there would, I would, we could all be the, I don't know. It would be infinite, right? It would go forever. Yeah. Also though, um, and Amber talks about this a lot. Progress isn't linear, right? And you need some easy days. And actually too, a lot of times during the week in a plan, there is one energy system, usually on that Tuesday, that Chad prioritizes. 
And that Thursday might even be a little bump or achievable, which means like kind of being really close to where you're at to maintain that, but that it's hard to increase, you know, three different energy systems, uh, or sorry, th increase on three different workouts in the same week, depending on your training history. If you're brand new, perfectly possible. If you've been training for a while, not so, um, not as much. So it is, it's kind of like getting on the scale and being like, every time I get on the scale, I should see my weight drop, right? Mm. If you're on a diet and you, you know, you should be on a diet and all that stuff. It's not possible. Uh, but you know, you, you fluctuate and you, you guys ever been on a diet and you get on the scale and you're like half a pound heavier mm -hmm. and things fluctuate and you, the day you feel different and you, um, you might have more water or salt in your body or glycogen and all that stuff changes the same thing with training. And depending on where you're on your phase, some achievable workouts will feel a little bit harder, right? Workouts that aren't supposed to be progressive because where they're in your training, they feel harder and you should be happy. Then this is like a sign that we gave you the right workout, right? Because if we gave you a really hard workout, it would be too hard. And this is too to main, I mean, Chad's got this in here where, um, you, some things we're maintaining or pushing forward a little bit, right? Chad, am I making all this stuff up, but no, 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 no. <laughs> spot on, keep going. Spot on. Okay, cool. Uh, Chad looks at me just like, he's like, uh, he's got this look on his face. Where are you going with this, buddy? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, no, dude, you should be increasing every single workout. Like <laughs> the easy days, like do some sprints in there. Uh, uh, so anyways, yes, you should not, uh, it is, especially as you get the higher level, it is those, those little changes, you celebrate them even more. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to see your FTP go up, like, uh, and you know, do a plan, but if you ever think you're stuck and you're like, I just, AFTP doesn't give me a higher FTP or the ramp test doesn't give me um, a higher one threshold, look at your threshold and VO2 max. And if you can increase those by, you know, if you keep going up on those, it is absolutely positive your F, your threshold will go up. So if you're at a four at whatever FTP you're at, and they are hard workouts or very hard workouts, and you get that to an eight, there is a yeah, hundred percent chance, right? hundred percent chance. And the nice oh, yeah. part is those steps, you can be 0.1 per week. You can be 0.2 per week. They can be very small steps, but if you are consistent over time, mm -hmm. you can get there. And then it's just like, you don't have to wait for that test. You know, it's going to be an increase. You don't know how much, but like you, the difference between a four and an eight is gigantic, right? For, for, for performance. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's so noticeable and it feels really good. Uh, it feels so yeah. good to be, to, to have that increase. Yeah. If, if it, I could, Oh, sorry, Chad, please. Well, I have a few things to say. So if you want to get something quick, yeah. fire away. cool. I'll get something quick in there. I want to just reiterate what Nate was saying and, and just for clarity's sake, and to make sure it's really understood your plan has X amount of days only a select amount of those days are meant to move the needle and increase that energy system. Other days it's meant to simply maintain. And so it's, it's not a situation where you can expect it to go up. That's a, that's the sign of a well-structured plan, right? Uh, that doesn't just try to drive you up in every possible way, every single workout. And you know, that, that's how, that's how you achieve burnout uh, very effectively. If you, <laughs> if you end up plateau, doing that, right? totally. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Chad, you say yours, then I have another point on this too. Before we move okay. on, okay, and I have a few things, and they kind of touched on these, but I wanted to actually, it's perfect piggybacking on top of what all all he's already said because all of this just ties in really, really nicely. What I really wanted to address though is that how improvement can be so marginal that at times it appears to almost not be occurring at all, and that it might escape your view if you don't know where to look. So wh whether it's measurable in some fashion, you know, whether you're using VO2 max intervals and the progression between them, whether you're doing an actual VO2 max test, a muscle biopsy to look at markers, a blood draw to look at markers, whatever it, whatever it is, and maybe it's not easily measured. Maybe you don't have this, any of these technologies available to you. It's not realistic. Just know that with consistency, proper progression, adequate recovery, sufficient fueling, all the things it's happening. Just trust the process. And, and, and I could just leave it at that, but I did look at a couple of studies because I really wanted to re-familiarize myself with certain rates of adaptation. I wanted to come into this and say, Ken, this is going to adapt at roughly this rate. This is going to adapt at roughly this rate. And, and I read through these papers again, as a, from just a few years ago, we got a McInnes and Jabala and then Hughes Olufsen and Keith Barr and, and they're good papers and there's tons of information to be gleaned and I could get specific with it, but really I just want to focus on what I got to remind myself of. And, and the, 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 there were a couple things. One was that there's no single adaptation that means anything in isolation. 
And that's kind of beside the point here, but it's kind of on point here because you're just looking at the VO2 max system and specifically high intensity VO2 max intervals and how they're stacking one on top of the next. But these, these papers also help me affirm what we all know and that, that the incremental nature of improvement is almost always too small to measure. You know, we're not, we're not going to see these stepwise improvements on a, on a daily basis. And on top of that, when any adaptation may exhibit some, we hope, positive effect on performance comes down to many variables. I mean, simple fatigue from a prior workout could mean bombing the next, but it won't necessarily mean that improvement isn't in the works, that it's somehow stalled. You know, all of these adaptations and the, the downstream performance effects that we hope to derive occur marginally. And, and I should also mention that while uh, just one workout may in fact pave the way for a small bump in performance, it could show itself, and Nate touched on this, in ways outside of or beyond an improved version of that same workout. So for example, you can do a hard VO2 max workout and it may not immediately lead to successful completion of a harder VO2 max workout, but it could lead to greater increases in your steady state capacity, your sweet spot capacity, greater endurance capacities, should you perform one of those workouts next? And then you'll see evidence of it in those workouts. But the simple point that I'm trying to make is that you may be, and probably are improving even when it's not obviously apparent. Yeah. yeah. And well there's said. a, I have two points on this. One is it doesn't. So how well you nail a, uh, a, uh, a workout, if you pass it and like our ML says that you pass it, like you, that will be your new progression level. Like that is, that's the score that you get. Our next one that we give you that increase has, is a bunch of other stuff that gets into that. So we, um, we actually went back and forth of like, which one should we show the athlete? Cause we have like an internal one of what they should, their next workout should be. But basically I like to think of it as like you're lifting weights. And if you can bench press 100 pounds, then you can bench press 100 pounds. That doesn't mean your next workout, you should bench press 110 pounds. Like sometimes you have a deload week, it could be a, a 80 pounds, right? It could be yeah. anywhere inside of that. And that's an important it, point is it, 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 that doesn't mean that it should always be 100. That's the, that's the, like, that's the yep. key. Sometimes it needs to be less. Yeah. yeah. I, I love the weight training analogy of this. Cause imagine if just every workout for one when you train max. weights, you just <laughs> add five pounds, right? You do the same reps, just add five pounds. You would be, I mean, you would be Arnold Schwarzenegger. You'd be. We're not equal. It'd be amazing. Uh, I can't think of any famous power lifters. It wouldn't though. happen though. <laughs> it's just yeah, exactly. not possible. It's not possible. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter about that. And even the RPE, if you, um, if you do your workout of 5.0 and it's all out, that's still your progression level. But if it's all out, then adaptive training will probably not give you a 5.2 next time because that we're at your limit. And what Chad said, it could take a while too to absorb that. Maybe we put you again out of five, maybe put you at a 4.8, see where you're at. Um, and these things always change too. So anyone listening to this, like this is constantly being tweaked on the back end. Uh, we learn more stuff from machine learning. Uh, there's analysis from, from uh, 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 data engineers and stuff like that uh, to figure out what's going on. The second part is that, oh yeah, we, we've talked about this a lot too, is you can be really focused on your FTP, but because we have progression levels, Let's say you were at, you know, two, you're around 260 and you've been there for a while. This is just in general. I don't think this happened to you, uh, Ken, but if you go from during this time, if you went from like a level two anaerobic to a level eight or nine anaerobic, it is perfectly possible that you have the same threshold, but your anaerobic system is just crazy. And if you look at the difference between those workouts, the repeatability, mm -hmm. right? When you get far into those anaerobic things, um, anaerobic high workouts and the amount of power that you can do is insane. And that may or may not change your threshold, correct, Chad? Like lots of anaerobic work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you yeah. can have a, a FTP that's basically topped out and then layer anaerobic work on top of it, see vast improvements or at least some improvement in the anaerobic system and not even affect your FTP. And I think too, yeah. you can have it where you do get more anaerobic work contribution to your um, threshold, but you haven't been training your, your threshold very much and that actually goes down, but you kind of end up in the same spot. Uh, it's different depending on the um, race execution. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah. yeah. It, and, and the workouts that you've done before. So mm -hmm. that's just a great example of, we've talked about so many times FTP isn't everything. And with adaptive training, the cool part is that it is unlocked from FTP and you can look at your improvement in all these different systems. Um, uh, and, and depending on the type of race and like your endurance could go up and your FTP might not go up. Um, 
usually will, but it might not. Uh, so yep. just saying there, it's decoupled. Uh, so we're only halfway through Ken's question. We should probably continue. Yeah, and Nate, I kind of want to target a lot of these at the Nate at chat if that's okay, and Ivy, because uh, I feel I, like, I like they're, they're good for. Awesome. Um, that's done. I'm going to target you, you, Nate. I'm done. Good job, Nate. <laughs> Peace out. Uh, rapid fire for Nate then from Ken. He says, if I feel strong, should I ride above the workout levels, say in the last few VO2 max intervals in a workout like Goat Citadel or last few overs in F, which by the way, best workout name ever. Um, yeah. Uh, last few overs in FTP workout like Tioga, something like that. Yeah. So here's how it works today. Um, for these, I would not, and I would lower um, I would lower, I would just do the right RPE for what it was prescribed. And if it is easy, you'll have a lower RPE and then adaptive training will push you further faster. Uh, with workout levels V2, which we've talked about so much, I, I know it's, I'm, I sound like a broken record, but the validation is so important on this because if we, uh, I've called this like the most important decision of trainer road of like internally of when we launch this, because if it's not amazing, there could be, a uh, real bad brand damage. So I want to have it be checked all these different ways against all this different data. And we have enough data that we can kind of go back and run simulations and the engineering to run those simulation takes a while. And it's, it's not that it doesn't, I mean, it works and we could probably launch it today, but I am a very, uh, conservative, cautious person on these sorts of things. And I want to really make sure that we are really, really, uh, sure that it's great. And maybe we can even share some of the data we launched. That'd probably be a cool marketing thing, John. Like all the ways Absolutely. we checked it and validated. That's plan, I yeah. Know, okay, you're thinking ahead of me. So <laughs> when we when we do that, what it does is that will give you specific points like uh, in that energy system, if you go over or under, or if you add sprints. I think in that, um, we talked to John, that video you did about the sprint interval training. Yeah. Which yeah. you can get like, spoiler alert, but you can get benefits from all out 30 second sprints. And which yeah. is great is when we're doing group workouts, I thought about this Chad or um, Pete and I, I was doing this, um, I would do like Baxter and then the next day I would always have rest. And uh, at the end of Baxter, Ch Pete and I would do like 30 second interval sprints seated and we do like five of them. And I, the next day was rest. And I, the key part of this is that it was not impacting my next hard workout. Mm -hmm. And man, those were great for crit snap. Like I felt better. And I think it actually did raise my threshold like anecdotally. And then you got some science that That's actually a good works. Video. Yeah. You also yeah. Should go check it out. Yep. Yeah. But the opposite side is man, if you, they're also very taxing and if it's not <laughs> lined up, it could be a, this is a side note, John, but on that video, it could be a good thing of, um, you know, you're, you're coming into, sometimes you get those full forced rest, right? You're like, ah, oh, my schedule's too busy, but it's not a bunch of stress. Um, adding some of those like endurance rides, some of those sprints at the end, uh, yeah. could be a good way to give yourself a little bit more, um, like, uh, so you can get more compensation, right. And get those sprints. Sure. Absolutely. I, yeah. Anyways, I, I, I just had COVID. So I, I'm, I'm trailing more than, uh, <laughs> than, than obvious. That's why. So what was the question again? <laughs> um, <laughs> the question was if they should lift oh, yeah. at the end of the workouts. And no, I, I mean, in general too, what this does is if you lift at the end of the workout, the nice thing about adaptive training is when we have the next one in, we will see that you went over and then we can make adjustments in the future. But today, the over part, we don't, <clears throat> we see in some terms, um, in sort of TSS yeah, and stuff, but we don't give it. you those points. Yeah, it still tracks it, but it, it's, this is all like kind of nuanced stuff, but in general, in most stuff, it's not a good idea to do it because how often, I mean, who, how many people here have done that? I've, uh -huh. you, you're like, I feel amazing. This last one, you go in all that effort. And then what happens is you like fall off a cliff because you did too much. Or in two days or in a Recovery. week. It's, it's, it can be like a pattern, right? Ivy, I'm sure you've experienced it with your training over the years of like right wanting now. to do more. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so yeah. tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we blew it up a Tahoe trail 100, I think. Um, but it's, it's, it just don't lift. It's, it's also, it requires a certain level of discipline that I actually think is really beneficial for bike racers as well adaptive training is still going to say, Oh, I see that they did more than what was required. It's going to take that into account. But, uh, so don't worry about that aspect of it. What my main concern is, is the next day and the next day. And then the next week, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I haven't met many people who are doing a training load that allows them like a huge amount of headroom. 
most people, their life fills in the gaps, right? So like, let's just say that you're doing what you feel like is a really conservative training plan. And so like you're doing low volume, but you feel like you could do mid or high maybe. But at that low volume, life has a way of taking up all the headroom in between your training stress and what your body can actually handle. And if you're always bumping up against the stops, that means that when life does fill that in, it's going to throw everything off. So I always think of that whenever I'm tempted to lift, because I absolutely love the freshman kick, like inside a part of me wants to like kick at the end of everything. Right. But I remember, and I remind myself, Hey, you don't know what's coming in a week. Uh, let's just be conservative. Let's hit our targets and let's favor that consistency above her, like the heroics that I could have in just this one moment. This is actually during COVID. I had my best stretch of training ever. And I was, I mean, COVID kind of simplified everyone's lives, right? Cause there wasn't a lot of yeah. stuff happening. I mean, it messed up a lot of lives too, but I was lucky enough where it was just work and family, nothing else. And, uh, you know, we were insulated. No one got sick. And during this time we had group workouts as we still do. And I was doing them with Pete. And I remember this specific workout. I was doing like holly volume sweet spot. I was nailing it. And at the end of one of them, I think it was either a 10 or 20 minute interval. So it was at like 365. I, I did that last one at like 370 or 380 because Pete was there and my ego got in the way, right? How often does that happen? It's, it's an <laughs> yeah. ego thing. It got there and it felt amazing. And it's like that one where you keep adding the Watts, like you add it up uh -huh. and you still feel like on top of it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm a domestic pro now. This is amazing. Like <laughs> the whole life's changing. Cat one is happening as soon as races are, are coming back and I did it. And then I, I had such a downfall and it took me, I think four to six weeks to get back to feeling even like, like anything. And it's because I did those things at a, I had such a huge training load. And then I really overdid it in that last workout. And that was just enough. I was on that edge just to you know, I was leaning over the edge and it just got a little push and I fell yeah. off and it was very bad. So yeah, in general, uh, don't do that. Um, yeah. Resist the urge. Mm -hmm. uh, Resist next the question. Urge. Does my survey answer quote matter in progression levels in adaptive training? Yeah. So I think I answered this progression level, like you'll still score it, but how adaptive training adapts to it is important because this is that, that, um, this is really, really important if you're going to build an adaptive training system that is a competitor trainer road, and we just tell everybody. Because, <laughs> well, if, well, if you do a, so John, Ivy, Chad, and I, we do two by 20 at threshold. Okay. What is the next workout should be? We could have completely different experiences on this. Uh, for Ivy, it could be easy. She's like, oh, that's really easy. That was, or moderate. For, for Jonathan, it could have been an all out effort where, it was dying, but it, the power graph could look exactly the same. And you could say, well, why don't you look at heart rate response? There is heart rate can be impacted by so many reasons. And sometimes when you're tired, actually heart rate could be, could be lower or it could be easy. And that's why heart mm -hmm. rate's lower. And you can see if you're trying to build an ML system to be able to understand this, which one is it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Mixed signals and, you could get. Yeah. And you could be, well, wait, look at past training load. Well, some people with past training load, that actually they recovered each time and they got better. And some people, they did not. Um, there's other things that we're looking at. And, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of HRV stuff that we have, uh, interest in, especially like in workout that I know is on the roadmap, which, uh, you know, it's, we'll see if there's anything we have. So we have such an amazing data set. Um, I know I've said this a lot of times, but to be able to look at, you know, tens of thousands of rides sometimes per day, to see what happens and then do that over years. Um, mm -hmm. it gives us a lot more stuff than some scientists who, you know, it's just a, you know, with funding and stuff, you have 20 people in a lab for six weeks. Um, it, there's a difference in the amount of like, uh, nuance we can see in the data. So sure. survey answer, it does not matter for what you score on the progression level that like you bench hundred, you get hundred, but for adaptive training, it definitely takes into account and can push it a different way. And that's why it's very important to know it. And also that's why we say, if you, um, if you finish a workout early, like you end a workout, it could be because you are thrashed, you're tired. It could be because it was too intense. It could be because, um, your wife's pregnant and you have to go to the hospital, right? Um, by the way, John, if you gotta go, I got you. I know. Probably... I keep checking my phone. <laughs> I know. Right. I, I saw that. I was yeah. like, I will yeah. take over the podcast. Um, <laughs> this, uh, so in order for us to build a system, like if you leave because someone, uh, you know, 
knocked on the door. That's much different than if uh, you were just fatigued or intense, because those are also different things. And your power file could look exactly the same. Have you guys ever done that where your your power file looks amazing, and then you just give up? You're like, okay, yeah. this is done. Um, yeah. so sometimes it goes down, like you know, like uh, like the stock market or something that you can just like <laughs> go, keep going down and down and down. But yeah. uh, other times it's uh, yeah, you just can't tell. So that's why we need this extra level of qualitative data from the human in response. Yep, super important. Long answer. I really like this stuff. This is the most rapid fire section I think I've ever endured. Um, says, <laughs> I, says uh, the next part, I guess overall, I want to maximize the benefit of each workout. And I wonder if I'm focusing on the wrong things with progression levels. And if so, what tips to get the most out of those painful VO2 max and threshold days? There's a lot to unpack there. But Nate, if I could just step in on this one, I think that uh, progression levels are fantastic as long as you understand them within the right context. Like they shouldn't be a thing where every single workout they go up. As long as you have that understanding that they're a measure of where you're at, then I think that that's a fantastic way to do it because sometimes our FTP isn't going to budge very much or not at all. Heck, your FTP might even go down, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we attach that to our self identity and you're like, oh, FTP is down thusly. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not achieving like I should be progression levels will show you the fact that you're actually improving in, in other ways. In many cases, uh, it's really cool. So I think that progression levels are a good focal point as long as you understand them with the right context. Yes. And two, we have workout alternatives. So if, if Ken, you're feeling like, Hey, I could do a little bit more. You can look for what is called a stretch workout or just one that advances a little bit more. No, this is, this is kind of like your, here you guys where Waze or Google maps tells you to go someplace and you're like, mm -hmm. but I know a shortcut. I'm going to outsmart yeah. this system and occasionally it works, but yeah. if you get stuck behind traffic, you shouldn't blame Google, Google maps or ways. So in this one, if you do want to try to do that and increase that and challenge yourself, it's totally valid. Just take that in the context of if it goes too much, you might need more recovery. It might hinder your progressions inside of this. Um, and it's unlikely that you're going to really do stretch after stretch after stretch after stretch. Um, if you're feeling really good one day and, uh, slept well, you know, everything's just set up. You can totally do that. So I say to maximize it is do the workout sp specific to what it is. And then if you are feeling, you know, answer the RPE uh, questions accurately. And if you do want to, you can pick a little bit more higher progression. And again, if you get from four to eight on, on pretty much any zone, that's a huge change in performance. Yeah. Ivy, what say you, uh, being the community manager, you deal with this sort of thing all the time. Yeah. If Ken is looking for ways to maximize the benefit of workouts like VO2 max and threshold days, you also have to be willing to maximize the benefit of the rest of the full scope of your workouts. So endurance mm -hmm. workouts and easy recovery workouts and things that, you know, you don't maximize the benefits of those endurance days by doing more endurance. That's not, that's not the purpose. So looking at those individually is really important. And this is really appropriate, Ivy, because Ken then says, by the way, all my riding is outdoors. And I love the way that Trainer Road translates the workouts to my Garmin head unit by adding the extra steps to get in the right spot for the next interval set, which is huge. And I can't believe that other uh, services don't do this. Like this is how outdoor workouts should be built. It's so incredible. But this is why it's really important because it's easy when you're outside to not follow with as much adherence to maybe tack on some extra, maybe go a little harder. Uh, you know, you sprint for us to, for, to like make a light or something like, that. I don't know. There's, there's lots of different temptations when you're inside, it's super focused and you don't have those temptations and you can just do the work. So it does require, like you said, a lot of diligence to adhere and make the easy days easy. So then that way you can make or adhere and really check the box on those harder VO2 max and threshold days that can be tricky to do. It may be just as important as those hard days to stay compliant to those easier days. They super serve their purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then I have to ask this question because it also uh, has been asked in the live chat basically every single week. It's always asked. P.S. When will adaptive training start using all that unstructured ride data to further tune my workouts? I mean, it's constant. There's always like... I, I mean, I would not be surprised as if, if in 30 years, we're not still improving it. And it's not something that it's ever going to be like, Oh, it's done. We know everything. And let's just move on to, I don't know, something else. It is the strategy of this company to have this investment go 
in the research and analysis of the data and learn more stuff and pull more data in for as long as it goes, because I believe that is the human body is so complex. There's so many inputs there is, it's just goes forever. It's basically infinite, like how much we can do. Uh, mm -hmm. and the, the cool part is it's very measurable as you can add things and be like, does this work on historic data? And then we can run it on, uh, on new people and new cohorts and you can get more specific for people. And I, I know specific projects that I'm I'm not going to talk about right now the roadmap that will also improve this too. And we've learned stuff from our data already and made improvements and it's just a constant thing. I think I said yeah. before, like in two years, right, you should look back. Uh, and we like, I think when I said this, it was before adaptive training was even out, was, yeah. you should be like, wow, I can't believe we trained that way. So in two years from now, we should hopefully make train road today obsolete, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And then two years from then, and then two years from then, uh, just like this happens in medicine too, right? As things get better and better, you're like, I can't believe in the, we used to put leeches to like suck people's blood out. Um, yeah. I guess that's not a good example, <laughs> yeah. but procedures get better. Every, things get better in, um, you know, yeah. in anything. And in terms of directly answering that one right now, it's, we're, it's like the main company priority and we're working on it. Um, so to the point where it starts to bring in those outside rides. And it does, uh, I mean, the instructor ride data it's used, I think what you're talking about is scoring them. The scoring yeah. them I talked about, but it is used in a lot of other ways, especially, I can't get this point across enough on the forum. Uh, AFTP detection takes into account all your rides, your unstructured outside rides, mm -hmm. your Zwift rides, any other rides, as long as the power data coming in or heart rate on it, uh, it can be heart rate by itself. We take that into account for AFTP detection. Yep. It just does not change your progression levels specifically. Constant improvement. Zach's question. Uh, hey gang, huge trainer road fan. You've helped me perform to the best of my ability in many triathlon races and new adaptive training progression levels chart has been so useful through all the resources you offer. I've learned to not only be more confident in myself and racing and daily life, but I've become a much healthier physically and mentally athlete as well. Now that I have the sweet talk out of the way, <laughs> my question, I think this is Zach Josie, by the way, uh, he is uh, one of our successful athletes podcast, uh, guests that we've had. Zach has branded himself the world's fastest dwarf. Uh, Zach's a super inspiring uh, person that's like persevered through a ton. Um, he has dwarfism and he is able to achieve really impressive things in triathlon. It's just a super inspiring uh, athlete. The amount of work he's gone through to get his bike set up and his then the right wetsuit and everything else is just astounding. So thanks for writing it in, Jack, uh, Zach. Zach says, I know the benefits of heat training for a hot race. I basically know all the common protocols and whatnot, but I work in the sun and heat all day doing construction. Is there any science out there that would say I get adequate? And he says in quotes, heat training just by being at work, because I want to know if I could in theory, skip the sauna sessions and still get the benefits because I'm in the heat all day. Good question. Hey, Chad. It's a really good question. Can we, can you read Sam's also? I would just want to lump these two in since they're very related. Would love to. Sam says, Hey gang, wonder, wonder if you have any specific tips and tricks on for training in the heat. We're currently in a heat wave here in the UK and I'm finding training inside and outside much harder. Any advice on how to lower my RPE whilst training in the heat would be much appreciated. Uh, Zach, this is amazing. I don't think we've ever had this question <clears throat> and this awesome. is such uh, awesome. All yeah. these new questions, like amazing, Zach. Yeah, I know. Back. I didn't, I didn't think we could beat this or flog this horse yet again and still find new information that's actually <laughs> relevant and, and truly <laughs> useful. And of course, I think it's a great question because I've had this exact question and I've actually tried to put this to use, but I've never researched it. So thank you, Zach, for providing the impetus to actually do the work. So let, let, I, I want to go back to a study that we've referenced a number of times when we talk about heat training, because it uh, provides a really concise summary of everything involved in achieving basically performance improvement in the heat via heat exposure. And this is a 2016 paper by Salka and colleagues that provides a refresher on some key points. And they start out by pointing out that everything we do is with the aim of adaptations that reduce strain and in doing so improve performance. And then when it comes to the heat, we also reduce the risk of heat related illness. So without certain physiological adaptations in place, truly catastrophic failure can result from trying to apply cooler temperature capabilities. I mean, we know what we can do in you know, cooler ambient temps and we think, well, it's just hot. I should be able to rise above that. Mm, absolutely not. Not unless certain things have taken place. 
That's Namely, sure. we, <laughs> it is for sure. And I, I, yeah, we've all if, felt if it. If you right? come up Where against it, it can be oh, a real scary thing, it, it, depending like that on how first, far you push it. That first hot race, right, Chad, that you encounter in the year. And it's mm-hmm. just, it, it's so, um, you leave disillusioned because it's like, these are numbers I've done <laughs> like for months now. And I yeah, can't that, even get Yeah, and that's just to. on the psychological side. The physiological side is far more threatening. Yeah. No doubt. So namely what we're talking about here is we have to be able to reduce our core temperature. It is that simple. And and this paper also points out that capabilities are what they are, but you know, as we're talking about right now, the circumstances can dictate what's accessible, right? So it's kind of like how we've talked about FTP is what it is, but how much you can actually express hinges on many factors. You know, you bring in fatigue to the table. Did you get your nutrition, right? What's your psychological state, et cetera. And you know, what's the ambient temperature or the heat like, you know, are you in hot conditions? Did your fan die? Are you wearing extra layers? Is it humid, et cetera. And then finally, this particular paper reminds us that heat adaptation can be achieved either naturally. And this is basically what Zach's talking about or artificially. And we've covered that a lot. So if you want to dive into that you got to go back to previous podcasts and I'm sure there's uh, someone who will steer you to them. But to your question of, and th- this is again, relating to the Salka paper, the magnitude of adaptations depends largely on what you might expect, the intensity, the duration, the frequency of your heat exposure. Are you doing it a couple times a week, one time a week, five times a week, and then the total number of heat exposures typically prior to your event, typically prior to the highest level of adaptation that you might achieve. So a couple points here. First is that like anything else, specificity matters, but to a degree in this case, because some adaptation does happen during simple exposure to heat. However, your necessary level of adaptation may not be achieved without similar types of exposure. Specificity is all we're talking about here. So for example, you can cultivate a big aerobic base or big VO2 max by doing long, slow distance, right? Low intensity work, but it doesn't necessarily confer an ability to ride at high percentages of that high VO2 max. To do that, you probably have to practice riding at high percentages of the high VO2 max. So while working in the sun can influence your heat tolerance, both physiologically and psychologically, the degrees to which it does so may be insufficient. And and I'll reference the Salka paper one last time by quoting to optimize performance, the exercise heat stimulus should stand or should as closely as possible simulate the expected climate exercise conditions during competition specificity. Okay. Makes sense. So, so that with that in mind, one question did cross my mind and is it, it's, is there a performance benefit due to the long-term nature of your heat exposure? Because I suspect this is at least five days a week and, you know, many hours across the day. And this brought me to a 2019 paper by Mickelson and colleagues where they looked at much longer term instances of training in the heat, wherein 21 reasonably fit cyclists change or didn't their training for five and a half weeks. In in all cases, they did their high intensity training in normal settings, but the heat group did roughly 30 one hour low intensity sessions in heat. So in particular, it was 40 degrees Celsius. So 104 Fahrenheit, that's legit hot. And then they used 15 kilometer time trials to assess changes in performance and the determined acclimation, uh, whether it was achieved or not by looking at lower sweat sodium, lower steady state heart rate, and then improved submaximal exercise endurance in the heat. And what they found was that in cool conditions, neither peak power output nor VO2 max improved in the heat intervention, didn't have any impact. And and then both groups saw similar improvements in TT power, but the submaximal exercise performance in the heat did improve in the heat subjects. So this just brings up the question, what events are you pursuing? Because Zach, you didn't mention them, but if you're doing low and slow stuff, this might actually be beneficial to you because they're rates similar to those, which you'll work at. If you're doing high intensity stuff, well, it probably isn't going to carry. So the takeaway is that the intensity or really the specificity was lacking. You know, the body simply didn't adjust to higher intensity demands, but what about TT performance in the heat? And they didn't mention this, but my bet is that heat would maintain the heat training group. The people in that intervention would probably maintain a greater percentage of their power output improvements due to both physiological because they did acclimate and psychological factors. They're simply familiar with, you know, exposure to the heat while they work. And then uh, one one last study, it's a, a review from Heathcote and colleagues in 2018, looked at the possibility of employing passive heat acclimation strategies. And they use a sauna, hot water immersion and heat chambers 
And where Zach falls is kind of somewhere in between. He's not working at high intensity, but he's not sitting in a sauna trying to incur heat adaptation. Rather, he's doing a fair amount of work across a long, hot day. And concrete is the specific type of work that he does. So quite okay. laborious. So, so, so pretty, pretty hard work, you know, I mean, yeah. depending, you know, he could be standing running while, while, while a truck, yeah, I don't know, it, it, it can range, but the yeah. point is he's probably doing some legit physical labor. Uh, with this study, they did find that passive exposure actually induced heat adaptations that led to the things we want, increased exercise performance, improved thermal regulation, improved cardiovascular responses, and improved perceptual ones. And this somewhat addresses Sam's RPE question. And then the same goes for a couple other studies that noted reductions in RPE as a result of repeated exposure to heat. So simple familiarity reduced the RPE. And on that same note, I did come across one study where a menthol mouth rinse actually reduced RPE. And in the case of that study, it was substantial hmm. by 15%. So there, there's a couple little things to tack on just in terms of addressing how to affect the RPE in the heat. But the, but the point here with this Heath, Heathcote paper was that even passive exposure to heat yields adaptations. So my guess for Zach is that your less than passive exposure is very, very likely to work at least as well as these passive strategies, but comes with a rather large caveat because it seems to work best when the exercise precedes the heat exposure and with a minimal gap. Mm -hmm. So in order to maximize the thermoregulatory adaptive responses, their recommendation, and this is based on a review of 16 very highly related articles minimum duration of 30 minutes per heat exposure session on consecutive days with a minimum of six to seven exposures directly prior to your events. So how would Zach roll this into entire days where he's facing this, this heat challenge? And, and I just have one suggestion, just one possible scenario could exercise at lunch, work in the heat directly after for 30 minutes and then slap on a cooling vest and actually link to the one I just bought. It's pretty sweet and pretty cheap. Or he could simply find other ways to bring his core temperature back down, but he could actually mm. enact this at work. If lunchtime workouts aren't an uncommon thing, go back out into the heat, suffer through it for 30 minutes, and then find cool. a way to cool yourself off. It sounds rough. <laughs> it does, but <laughs> I'm it's, it's something you could do in the field. Zach being like a roofer or something coming back from lunch workout and just, uh, just dragging <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the tri suit still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's look like that. That sounds really rough. Uh, thinking back to our podcast, we did the science of getting faster episode with Dr. Chris Minson, where we talked about heat training. There was a lot of discussion about the protocol suggested protocol of directly after your training, you follow it up with just going straight into that sauna. Um, and so this is, it's all backed up as well by this, by what you're talking about there. Uh, you know, this is Keegan's famous for saying, you know, altitude isn't real. And I think that what he's trying to do is adjust his psychological, uh, <laughs> recognition of it. Right. And I think that there's a lot of that to do with heat as well, to a certain extent, uh, whatever tricks you can do to lower RPE. And if one of those is to tell yourself that, Hey, I got this, it ain't bad. That certainly is one of them. But when we're talking about lowering RPE in the, in the heat directly to Sam's question, because <clears throat> I think that I, I guess to sum up really for Zach's question, it sounds like it absolutely isn't detrimental to his heat adaptation, right? Chad, to be working in the heat, it would be beneficial. Mm. Um, it's good. not, it's not like a very precise protocol that you would prescribe perhaps if you're shooting for heat adaptation, but it certainly doesn't hurt his heat adaptation. Yeah, There's very likely some bump, right? He probably has a higher plasma volume because he's out in the sun all day and his body has to thermoregulate. Totally. And to Sam's question of lowering RPE in the heat, uh, one of the best ways to lower. So if you lower your core temperature, yes, that is also, I know that's not just RPE, but it absolutely has a profound effect on RPE. <laughs> in in this case, one of the best ways you can do that is by taking in extremely cold liquids that are in some cases, like if you can take in a slushy of some sort, that's what we call them here in the or Slurpee in the U S but if you can have something that's like blended ice, and you can even put that in your bottles. Um, in fact, Jeff and Katerina, when they came up to the line for Tahoe trail 100, their bottles were slushies. They had froze them and then they had blended them and then they put them, which sorry if I'm giving away a tip uh, from them, but they, they freeze them and they freeze their, and they found that I think Jeff has found that if he puts his mix into his hi hydration pack reservoir, then freezes it, it doesn't fully freeze, but it turns into a slushy. So it's perfect. 
that sort of thing really helps. That's why we've been seeing Yumbo Visma take in gels that are <clears throat> that are partially frozen. They're like otter pops, basically, that's, that they're taking in. That's actual physiological cooling. And I think that's exactly that, that's what the point here needs to be is that it doesn't matter how well you can manage your perception, you're still being exposed to potentially dangerous heat. So you can yes. familiarize yourself with it and get used to it and not let it freak you out as much. But physiologically, things still have to happen. Core temperature does need to be managed. So really, RPE is only going to get you so far. Yeah. Ivy, do you want to share your trick for <laughs> managing oh, RPE that you use at Tahoe Trail on the last climb? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's going to make me sound insane. but um... <laughs> Hey, altitude isn't real. That's pretty insane. So <laughs> I thought Keegan's uh, thing was that heat isn't real. So I was like, yeah, I, I think he just, anything that. that opposes him is not real. That's what he tells yeah. himself. And yeah. it's at two. It's I'm go ahead. Ivy. <laughs> oh, um, I was truly thinking about, um, skate skiing in the winter and, um, a really cool spot up here where there's groomed track. And then a few miles down the road, there's a natural hot springs and how cold I would be. And always be, I would always think I can't wait to get in the hot water freezing and so i was literally thinking that on the last climb i was like man i just can't wait to get into a hot shower and chilly and it's <laughs> not scientific i'm so embarrassed but just no, like, it's it. that's not completely removed from science i mean you look at wim hof and the things that he does where it's it's largely perceptual and he modifies how his body responds to changes extreme changes in temperature yeah. I mean, I, there's, I say RP can only get you so far, but maybe it can get you a lot farther than, uh, than I'm giving it credit. Well, it was combined with actual things that were helping regulate my core temperature, like stopping at the last feed zone before the climb. And there was really cold water hmm. and dumping a that ton helps. of cold water on me. <laughs> and so like that combined with, you know, even like when I would feel a breeze on the climb, I think like Ober, you know, yeah. stuff like that would, hmm. would help me. Totally psychotic. I, I'm so embarrassed. I can't I, believe you exposed me. Like I think it's psychological. <laughs> Sorry, I, psychotic. I think it's a good tip though, because uh, look, there's a lot of low hanging fruit with how we manage our expectations and our recognition of our current situation. And mm -hmm. it's very easy for us to believe a story that is more dramatic than the reality. And that many times puts us in a spot where we then underperform because we haven't managed our mental space well enough. I think that it's like a super keen insight into a pro athlete that knows that, Hey, I can actually manipulate my perception of my current situation. And as a result, get more performance out of myself. That's pro level stuff, Ivy. So like, you should not be embarrassed about that. I, it's super <laughs> insightful. Pro level, I think pro level implies that it comes uh, on the heels of a lot of experience. So this, what I don't mm -hmm. want is people thinking, Oh, I can just manage this mentally. I, I can get around this. I can push as hard as I want to. This is all in my head. Cause it's not. But you yeah, know, true. But over time, the other, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. I've been on the other side of that where I let myself think so much about how hot I was, even mm. when I was doing all those things to manage my core temperature. And all I could think about is how hot it was. And it absolutely destroyed me, made that RP mm -hmm. worse Sure. because I couldn't get out of that mindset of just thinking about how hot it was. Yeah. It's, it's like, absolutely. It, we believe the stories we sell ourselves. Right. And and that ends up def defining how we apply our efforts in a race. The like really practical things in this case uh, that I would say, Sam, it's really hot right now. And when I go out for my workout, uh, I use a, I have these really tall bottles from a company called Zefal, uh, Z E F A L. You can look them up. They're like double the size of a normal bottle. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put my mix in that and that'll get me through a two hour workout. And then I carry another bottle and it's my pour bottle. And that one is filled with ice and water and it just melts throughout the ride. And then I use that one to just pour water on myself. I know it sounds really silly, but it's a small thing that I think a lot of us overlook. And that way you can just, it's just a little bit like after the interval or in the middle of the interval, a bit little splash on your legs, on your lower back, on your head, your neck, whatever else, your chest, your arms, just find those little spots. And oh my gosh, it feels so good. It's so invigorating. Been, been doing roughly the same thing with precision hydration has the well, basically, I think they're one liter size bottles. They're massive, but the same idea mm -hmm. The drink mixes in one waters in the other. And I don't splash myself with it, but I do stay well more hydrated than I have in the past because I have effectively four bottles on my bike. Then you could go really far and I don't know what they I've heard. I've heard, and this could be bad for your kit. This could be unhealthy. 
So I'm not recommending this. I'm just saying I've heard that people do it. Uh, and XCO races, I want to say it's like the bottles with the red caps that Nino used to get or blue caps had uh, rubbing alcohol or something like that in them instead of water. And it's this product called like cool off or something. And it's not sold here in the U S but it's sold in Europe. And I have no clue if that actually works. And I'd be really interested to see the science because the theory is that it evaporates quicker. And as a result, it would somehow cool you off or do a better job of cooling. But I know that they even do that in some cases and pour that on themselves. They of course do not ingest it. Um, you'd want to make sure that you don't do that. Be clear. Don't put <laughs> rubbing alcohol in your bottle to drink. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And they use go, it as like a pour bottle. So I would recommend uh, more than just a blue cap. I'd make that very clear. <laughs> just one mouthful of that. Mm. <laughs> Large sign. <laughs> Large sign. So I've never done that. I don't even think it's like legal to be sold here um, in the US. But anyways, uh, last question on heat and then we're done from Andrea. It says, hey, Trina Road team, love the pod. Part of my weekend chore ritual each week. I hope that we're not a chore. I hope that we help you through your chores, Andrea. <laughs> um, words matter. <laughs> uh, I have a question about swelling, uh, about swelling the day after long endurance rides. I've gotten into bikepacking the last couple of years. My friends and I sometimes wake up swollen around the eyes to quite varying degrees between us. And from one trip to the, to the other, it also varies. I haven't been able to figure out any correlation to hot days, electrolyte intake, intake. And then also Andrea mentions me and my friends all use noon primarily or fluid intake or dehydration uh, for dehydration. Uh, and they haven't been noticed any sort of correlation between cold or hot nights in the tent. While I appreciate the myriad of variables, I'm just wondering if you've looked into this before, is this an electrolyte imbalance issue or some other physical response to the effort? Well, I have noticed the swelling the day after a hard and long, hot gravel ride, sleeping at home, it seems more prevalent when bikepacking for some reason. Thanks. Chad, were you able to find anything on studies with this, like mm -hmm. heat and swelling and such? Kind of, kind of. So uh, I'll be quick about this. We're coming up against the two hour mark and I got place to go people to see so i'm gonna be super fast <laughs> no no i'm not, still I'm not. I just, you, Andrea. <laughs> I just i'm gonna be fast because there just wasn't a heck of a lot of information at least not that i could find so mm -hmm. andrea what you're describing is edema which is just excess fluid trapped in bodily tissues and typical typically this is a as a result of muscle trauma which explains muscle edema but in the case of the eyelids, and I hope it's eyelids because this is the closest I could get. They didn't describe eyes. They actually described eyelids, oddly enough. But it was a very recent 2021 paper by Gaukler and colleagues titled, Edema-like symptoms are common in ultra-distance cyclists and driven by overdrinking, use of analgesics, and female sex, a study of 919 athletes. And what they did was uh, an online survey 350 people, and 919 of them met the inclusion criteria. Of them, 603 reported suffering at least one potential, what they termed kidney function related symptom with 498 of them. So roughly 500 of them experiencing one or more edema like swelling symptoms. What was interesting about this is then the authors then took this data and they correlated this edema to swelling via linear regression modeling with the analgesics, as mentioned in particular NSAIDs, simple takeaway here, just avoid pain relievers on race day for a host of reasons. I feel like I don't need to explain that one. Gender appeared to occur more frequently in women. Uh, the authors didn't really elaborate on or speculate as to why. And then over drinking. And they looked at drinking in a, in a number of different ways. And one of the, a couple of things they found is those who drink or drank based on ambient temperatures and or the intensity of their sweating experienced more instances of edema. And this was especially true in those who drank as much as possible which is not a drinking protocol that we recommend. And then with respect to the eyes, or I hope the eyelids, um, when only drinking when thirsty, there was a marginal negative prediction. Uh, it was marginally negatively predicted for eye, eyelid swelling. Sorry, I'm saying that terribly. But what this could mean <laughs> is that there was less eye swelling because they were dehydrated. And then I should also mention they did not correlate edema in any form with electrolyte intake. That was part of their regressions. I feel like electrolytes get so much credit for perhaps more things than they deserve. Yeah, that's actually a, a kind of a hot topic right now. There's a, a lot of talk on that and I don't have anything to offer just yet, but I do feel like we're going to revisit that topic, electrolytes Ooh. and sweating and sodium loss, et cetera. 
Well, we're getting lots of questions for that. And if you have questions for the podcast, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast to submit them. We'd love to hear from you, whatever training questions you have. So do that. Rate this podcast on Spotify, on whatever app you use and share it with your friends and head over to our YouTube channel. Check out the new science, uh, the sprint intensity training video for Cycling Science Explained. We have another one coming up. And I even went firsthand through the protocol that we are talking about in the next video. It was uh, quite adventurous to go through. And I think I have to do it one more time to get content for it. So uh, it's going to be quite interesting. So stay tuned for another one. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and go to trainerroad.com and sign up to get faster. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye.